the work that I will present today is uh, mainly focused on NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD+, particularly, uh, which is a molecule that, that most of you, or if not all, will know from your textbooks, <clears throat> mainly as a, as a cofactor in energy metabolism, as a redox cofactor, uh, mainly in balance with NADH. Um, but in, in recent years, uh, probably the last two decades or so, uh, there's more and more evidence that NAD can more play a more pleiotropic role um, because NAD is also the, the substrate for several families of enzymes, including the PARPs, the poly-ADP ribose polymerases, the sirtuins, and the CD, CADP ribose synthases. And these enzymes, in turn, are not regulating just one reaction, but they are regulating many, many different reactions in the cell. Um, and therefore, NAD as a, as a substrate for these enzymes can play a very versatile role in managing cellular homeostasis. And by now, we, we estimate that NAD uh, participates in more than 500 enzymatic reactions, covering basically all the metabolic processes in the cell. But we started studying this a few years ago in collaboration with Lotte Greven, Don Joris Hoeks, and Patrick Schrauen at Maastricht University Medical Center, also in the Netherlands. And this is a study that was spearheaded by George Johnson, so PI in my, in my group. And um, what we did is basically we took biopsies, especially the team in Maastricht is actually the one doing the clinical studies, took biopsies, muscle biopsies from younger individuals, so typically uh, students, um, and from older adults who were between 65 and 80 years old, and they were subsetted according to their physical activity levels. So we had trained individuals, I would really call them strong athletes. I mean, they, they, they take about 14,000 steps a day, which is, is amazing. Um, we have a group that we decided to call normal older adults, but they take still 10,000 steps a day. So that's still, for me, at least uh, in, in the type of job that I have, is, is still, uh, still a lot, 10,000. Um, and we had a group of older adults that were physically impaired. So we really had evidence that there was some, some impairment in their physical function. They still take uh, uh, over 6,000 steps a day, but they were functionally impaired. So we were able to get the muscle biopsies, even from the, from the impaired group, which was uh, a bit of a challenge because they already have impaired muscle function. They still allowed us to take a muscle biopsy. We took the muscle biopsies and we performed metabolomics on these muscle biopsies to identify metabolic changes that can maybe explain the difference between younger individuals and older individuals, and maybe also the, the difference between trained older adults and, and non-trained older adults. And so this is the data that we, that we got. On, on the left, you see the volcano plot with all the metabolites annotated that are significantly changed between normal older adults versus young. So um, we, we see quite a few changes. They're, they are also highlighted here in, in the heat map, where the red signal means it's high and the blue signal means it's low. And the one that stood out for us, also because we are, of course, uh, uh, from an NAD background, is this NAD molecule, which is high or relatively high in the, in the younger individuals and then very much so reduced in, in older individuals. Um, there are several others that are also very interesting related to the NAD pathway, like kinurinic acid. Um, also, ophthalmic acid is an interesting one because it has to do with reactive oxygen species, although it's also a little bit different than, than, than really reactive oxygen species. So we're, we're looking into several of these um, uh, changes um, uh, still today. But the one that stands out, like I mentioned, is NAD, which also seems to go down with age. And indeed, if you look at the individual values and you also, again, uh, classify by physical activity level, uh, you can see that there's this stepwise approach where older adults have a lower, uh, uh, general, generally lower abundance of NAD in the muscle, but this is relatively well preserved or maintained in athletic elderly. And it's, it's the lowest really in, in elder, older adults with an impaired uh, muscle function suggesting, but not causally demonstrating, that physical activity will improve your NAD um, uh, levels. That's, of course, I mean, the, the causal demonstration of that fact is, is something still to be 
uh, established. Um, so we do see in preclinical models, mice, C. elegans, and now also in a clinical model, so in clinical setting in humans, we see that NAD goes down with age. And um, uh, the question is, can we fix this? Can we fix this age-related decline in NAD? And does that improve age-related diseases? Um, I, I mentioned nicotinic acid is one of them, uh, but we have several precursors, several NAD boosters uh, by now that, that, that we can employ to improve or, or restore NAD homeostasis. So one is tryptophan as an amino acid. We always considered tryptophan one of the minor contributors to NAD uh, biology. Uh, the major ones are nicotinic acids, nicotinamide, which is also is both a precursor and a downstream product of the NAD consumers. Um, nicotinamide riboside, which is a, a more recent addition to this portfolio, and also nicotinamide mononucleotide, which also is a, is a relatively recent. Both of these molecules, they, they sort of exist or have been studied only for the past 10 years in preclinical models and only for the last, let's say, five years in, in clinical models. So we know that each of these molecules, nicotinamide, riboside, NMN, and several of the others, in a few steps. Um, so here we have nicotinamide riboside, we have nicotinamide mononucleotide. In a few steps, they will be converted to NAD and elevate the NAD levels intracellularly. And so this is when uh, a postdoc approach, or he was a PhD student at the time, uh, and, and joined me in our lab as a, as a postdoc, is Ruben Zapata Perez. Uh, he now leads his own group at, at the University of Murcia in Spain. And he came with this procedure. He's an enzymologist, biochemist by training. He came up with this procedure of using NADH as a molecule and then incubating that with a pyrophosphatase from E. coli, generating NMNH, which is another NAD precursor. And then he has this fancy purification technique. I keep calling it just fancy purification, just for the sake, because I don't understand really what he's doing. But he has this fancy purification technique that, that allows him to isolate this, this pure NMNH. And the question was, can we use this NMNH as a precursor for NAD? And so the difference is really this H. So we knew NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, as a precursor for NAD that was, we already knew it for about 10 years. But now NMNH is a new one, new kit on the block. And can that one also increase NAD? And so this was basically the first graph that he, he showed me after going into the lab, um, exposing different cell types. AML12, a liver cell line. This is a adipose tissue cell line. Again, a liver cell line, fibroblasts. Um, a neuroblastoma cell line and, and HeLa cells, he exposed each of these cells to either NMN, so I, I would say the old fashioned NAD precursor, uh, as well as NMNH. I don't know why we have this old abbreviation, it was a secret abbreviation at the time. It is NMNH. Uh, so he exposed them to NMNH, and in each of these cell lines, uh, I mean, 10 years ago, we were we thought this was spectacular, like a doubling in NAD levels in, in a cell. Now, all of a sudden, we had a tenfold increase of NAD in, in each of these cell lines, except maybe the HEPG2, which are a bit less uh, uh, responsive. But NMNH is very potent, very potent in inducing NAD levels in all these different cell lines. So I won't go into all the details of, of the study. It has been published, um, but, but what Ruben did is to look at the enzymology of these pathways, look at the different enzymes that are involved in uh, converting NMN, the classical precursor, into NAD, and comparing each of these steps between NMN and NMNH. And he found that the majority of the pathway is identical. So there is still CD73, which is identical. It's still the ENTs uh, uh, doing the transport. It's still the NMNATs that, that catalyze the last step of the, of the synthesis. Uh, but the difference is mainly here. The difference for um, NMN, the classical one, it's converted to nicotinamide riboside. And then it's the nicotinamide riboside kinases that convert it back to NMN intracellularly. 
but for NRH, so or for M NMNH, it's converted to NRH, which is then integrated or in, um, imported into the cell. And then it's the adenosine kinase, which actually catalyzes uh, uh, this following step. So there is a difference uh, at, at the level of this uh, uh, phosphorylation uh, step, which seems to be uh, uh, the main driver of this differential response between NMN and NMNH. Um, so the next question obviously was, does it also work in vivo? So in cells, of course, that's very nice, but does it also work in vivo? Is NMN a potent NAD precursor there? So the study that we did is um, actually a very simple study. So we, we only injected twice uh, in the mouse and we compared to NMN, 250 milligram per kilogram per day, which is on the lower side of of what people typically use for NMN. We compare that to NMNH. We inject uh, intraperitoneally, um, and then 20 hours later, we inject again. And then four hours later, we sacrifice the mice. Throughout the study, at different time points after the first injection, we, we take blood samples from the tail vein. Um, and then after 24 hours, so four hours after the second injection, we take all the tissues and, and we follow up on, on the biochemistry. So this is actually what we saw when we, we did this time course experiment. So the first injection uh, takes place here at time zero. Uh, and, and one hour later, we measure NAD in, in the blood. Uh, and we do see that NMNH, not only in, in cells, as I showed before, but also in vivo in a mouse, is much more potent than NMN. And even after four hours, and even after 20 hours, so this blood sample was taken right before the second injection, even after 20 hours, we still see a high level of NAD in mice that are injected with uh, NMNH rather than NMN, because that one goes back to the baseline. Um, and this is still, uh, still high uh, after the second injection. So what happens in the tissues? Uh, same as with the cells, especially in liver cells, we see that NMNH is very potent. So we see with NMN, there's an increase in NAD levels, which again, we were always very positive about. So this is a doubling of NAD levels in the liver. But with NMNH, it's much more potent. It's a four time uh, increase in uh, NAD levels. And even in tissues that are notoriously more difficult for, for improving or, or elevating the NAD levels like gastrocnemius muscle, uh, also the brain, which typically don't respond very well to NMN, they do respond, although not spectacularly, but they do respond to NMNH. Still, the majority of, of the NAD increase we, we do observe in liver and kidney, which are always the most responsive tissues for these kinds of treatments. At the same time, also, for instance, still doing the mouse work, the mouse studies, to identify the mechanism by which NAD improvement um, uh, also improves the clinical field. Um, so that brings me to the conclusions of my talk. Um, we do see that NAD declines in tissues across various organisms, mice, C. elegans, but also humans. We do see that this associates with health status. So people who maintain an active life tend to have higher NAD levels. Although again, uh, the, the causal relation will have to be established. Um, we see that uh, uh, what I call classical NAD precursors, they're not so classical because they're only around for, for just over 10 years, but they have shown limited translatability to humans. The clinical trials, we do see some effect in one trial, some in others, but not very positive, like the preclinical models, which are massively positive. Um, we do see that these reduced NAD precursors like NMNH, but we also call, we also identified uh, together with uh, a group in, in Switzerland, NRH, uh, which is very similar actually. Uh, they, they may offer uh, uh, attractive opportunities um, uh, to improve NAD uh, homeostasis, but the, obviously there's more work to be done to um, apply this in a clinical setting. No clinical trials have been done with any of these molecules and they're very unstable also. They will not pass the stomach. Um, so there, there, there really needs to be a solution 
to, for instance, encapsulate the molecule to, to be able to, to use them. Um, and I think with the data that we have for Bar syndrome in this preclinical model, in this fly model, but also the trial that was done in mitochondrial myopathy for mitochondrial myopathy, um, I think boosting NAD levels could serve as a therapy, at least for some uh, inherited mitochondrial disorders. 